Well, thank you everyone for coming along and uh, once again, uh, welcome. Elder Carl has already welcomed you all and uh, we really appreciate that you chose to worship with us today. And those people who will be joining us online, God bless your heart. Thank you for connecting with us. And if you do visit our website, we do notice that. And uh, yeah, we thank you for being part of Garden City Fellowship Church. We have started uh, last week this two-part series. Uh, the first one was, uh, can we still believe the Bible and does it matter? And we, in our part one, address the second question where it says, does it really matter? Because if things don't matter, then we don't pay attention to them. Is it right? Do we agree? You know, if things don't matter, then why bother? So last week, we actually looked at why it matters for us to read the Bible, why it matters for us to trust God's Word. So today, actually, if you don't like archaeological, historical stuff, I'm sorry. Today is very much going back into the history. We will be tapping into archaeology as well to discover some of the evidences and facts that perhaps will help us to trust God's word more than what we do at the moment. And if you are uh, someone who at times have been, you know, filled with doubt and distrust in the Bible, then perhaps today is the time. Because I'll be sharing, as I was uh, preparing this presentation, I came across a number of things that really opened my eyes as well. So before we make a start, let's pray. Father in heaven, we come into your presence, Lord. As we touch on this very, very important topic, it's about your word. It's about the Bible. It's your word. And without your help, without the help of the Holy Spirit, we cannot explore this. So please bless us, open our mind, heart, and ears and eyes so we can hear you, see you, understand you. And please touch us with your spirit that if things appear to be convincing, convict us through your spirit to accept your word as the guiding book for our life. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few years ago, I had a privilege of... Uh, rendering jury services to New Zealand justice system. And while uh, I was in the court, I noticed one thing very interesting, and that was that registrar, as he came in, he had the Bible in his hands. And then, um, you know, they started the proceeding court began and uh, we had the witness in, in that box where they had to stand to, to give the witness or to share their story of things. And before they could do that, this registrar actually took the Bible to that witness and asked them to place their hand upon that Bible to take that oath that whatever they're going to share is true. I was quite fascinated because I'll be later on sharing with you some of the statistics how things are actually in New Zealand. But still, somehow, some way, we as a country believe that Bible can lead people to tell the truth. Bible can convict people to share something that is true. And everybody else, once the person has placed their hands upon the Bible, believes that the person who is going to share has already taken the oath and they will share the truth. That was quite interesting for me to notice. Uh, whereas we notice that today's popular culture and modern critics, they challenge the historical accuracy of the Bible. 
And that's all over in the New Zealand, in, in, in New Zealand as well. So from Exodus to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, from the book of Genesis till the, till the book of Revelation, you have nothing that is sacred to these modern critics. So most commonly asked questions are these. How reliable historically is the Bible? What reasons do we have for trusting in the accuracy of the biblical text? These are two very important questions. I want to take you quickly to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 36 and 37. Because we don't have much time, we're not really going to dig into that story. But what we're going to do is look at the overall situation and the context where this story takes place. Whatever is happening in Jeremiah, chapter 36 and 37. The year is about somewhat 604 BC. After Jeremiah was, uh, uh, delivered the straightforward message recorded in chapter 19, the prophet was seized and imprisoned. And we find that in Jeremiah chapter 20. It was during and after this imprisonment that the events of chapter 36, they take, they take place. The kingdom of Judah has a different king. His name is Jehoiakim. And Jeremiah, while he's in prison or he's forced out of people, he calls Baruch, one of his friends, and he asks him. He, Baruch had the skill of writing. He was a scribe. And Jeremiah asked Baruch, Baruch, why don't you please help me? I cannot go to the people. However, you can write whatever God is going to give me, and I'm asking you to put that onto the scroll and take it back to King Jehoiakim. Or first take it to the people as they attend worship in the synagogue and read it to the people. There was a lot in that scroll, but one of the key messages in that scroll was that the king of Babylon or Babylonian army, they're going to come and attack Judah. And all the people, they will be captives and he will destroy this land. Not really a good message to preach, right? If you, if you are telling a nation, you are actually a Jew and you are part of that nation and you're telling that, you know, someone else is going to come and take over our country naturally, people will see you as a traitor. They'll say, why are you promoting dismay and, uh, you know, cowardness amongst the people? And that's exactly what happened. The month was somewhat November and December, and the king was sitting in his winter palace or in the section where, where he could stay warm. And somehow this scroll makes its way to the king, and someone was reading this scroll to King Jehoiakim, and as this person is reading bit by bit, King is just cutting that scroll with the knife, and because the fire was on for him to stay warm, it was a winter season, he kept on throwing that scroll in the fire. He kept on burning it, and he was quite furious, especially when he heard this message that people will have to submit to the Babylonian army. If they fight back, they will be destroyed, they will be killed. Jehoiakim and his people, they didn't listen. They burnt that scroll upon which were the words of God. As I was looking around on internet, just wanted to look at some statistics within New Zealand. You know, you discover that even though today we don't have people burning the Bible as they did in the Middle Ages, even though we don't have people burning the scrolls as Jehoiakim did, still there are many people out there who through their distrustful words are planting the seed of distrust and doubt in the minds of our young people about 
this book. It was uh, written in New Zealand Herald website. It says that New Zealand is becoming less religious, exhibiting a sharp fall in the number of people who identify as Christians. And obviously, if somebody is claiming not to be a Christian, this book is the least thing they want to actually even look at it. Another survey that was conducted by the Bible Society, they, they had this graph in their research. I have it on the slide. This is what it shows. The question was, do the teachings of the Bible influence your life? And right at the bottom, you have the blue color showing yes, red color showing sometimes, green color is showing no, and again, I think it is purple color, which is unsure. So if you look at the general population, 21%, they answered this question, yes, do the teachings of the Bible influence their life? 21% said yes. However, 24% said sometimes. 47% said no. And 8% they said, oh, we don't even care. We don't know what, what it is all about. When it comes to Christians, you have about 56% people saying yes. 32% people saying sometimes. And 9% are saying no, 3% are saying unsure. It's, it was very interesting for me to notice the bottom line, where even the Christians, I mean, general population is a different story, but even those people who claim to be Christians, they answered this question, do the teachings of the Bible influence your life? And look at 32% people, they said only sometimes. Interesting. Why is it that there are many who don't see the Bible as historically authentic and reliable word of God, as there are many historical and archaeological evidences that echo again and again that God's word is true and trustworthy as it was in the past, likewise it is today. But why is it? For 32% people, the Word of God only works or influences their life sometimes. But when you add 9% and 3% into it, you have about, how much, about 42%? It's uh, 9, 3 is 12, 12 plus 32, 44%. 44% are on the other end of the scale. Only you have 56% who actually believe that Bible does influence their life, it does influence their family. So I'm going to take you on a journey right now. We'll quickly go through some historical evidences and facts that actually echo again and again that God's word is reliable and trustworthy. We'll start with the Old Testament. Number one discovery that was made is the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scroll was one of the greatest discoveries in modern times. Before this 1947 discovery, many skeptics, they actually questioned the book of Isaiah in the Bible. My wife, uh, she'll be sharing a message in the second Saturday of August, and she loves the book of Isaiah. She's taking it right now, actually, uh, St. Martin's Church through that journey of discovering and learning about the book of Isaiah. So just a quick Edward there that she will be actually preaching about it. So many skeptics, they didn't believe in the book of Isaiah. And when in 1947, there was one young man, he was looking after his goats and sheep. Um, and, and as he was grazing them around, he actually threw one stone into the cave and that stone went right into the cave and hit one of the jars in which they had those scrolls stored. And he was just a bit suspicious because the sound wasn't the normal one. He made his way all the way to, this, to the cave and then it was discovered that the cave was actually filled with many scrolls and many jars. And in that cave, this discovered 
one scroll. There, there are many other, other uh, elements that were discovered in the cave. But they discovered in that cave the scroll of Isaiah. And whatever was written on that scroll was exactly, almost exactly the same, except because people were write, handwriting and, you know, human error was there. Because when somebody is speaking and then you're writing as a human, you can miss her or, or you can miss a letter and so forth. But the accuracy was amazing. And those captives, they were surprised that actually the scroll that was discovered, it was 1,000 years prior to the copy that they had at that time in 1947. The discovery that was made, that scroll was 1,000 years older than the scroll that they had about the book of Isaiah. That was fascinating for for the scholarly world, and especially those people who were promoting the accuracy and the reliability of the Bible, they were over the moon. They were so blessed and happy that God actually led this young man to throw that stone in that cave, and those scrolls were discovered so that they could actually proclaim that the word of God is reliable. There's another discovery, the, the Hammurabi Stele. It was found by French archaeologists in the winter of 1901. This is about, uh, I would say, about 46 years before this Dead Sea Scrolls discovery. In 1901, they discovered that this Hammurabi stele. And one of the interesting things was that, you know, the King Hammurabi and his court of uh, rulership he had laws for the community to operate with. And some of the laws in that Hammurabi stele are very much similar to the laws that, that are found in Torah, and especially in the book of Exodus. And one of them is uh, Hammurabi law number 14. If a citizen kidnaps and sells a member of another citizen's household into slavery, then the sentence is death. That is found on this tele. But as you go to the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 16, exactly the same. It says, He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to death. Once again, scholarly world was amazed and surprised. Another discovery, the Mernepta uh, stele. It was found in the mortuary temple at Thebes, published in 1897, and today it is exhibited in Cairo. The stele celebrates Pharaoh's, uh, Pharaoh Manepta's victory over rebellious forces in his Asiatic possession. And in this stele, on this, there is the name of Israel mentioned. Because Egyptians and Israel, you remember Israelites, they were captives in Egypt. And to you it may appear very little, but for historians, archaeologists, this just shows the fact that people of Israel existed, especially the people who are mentioned in the Bible, they existed historically. Then there is another one, the Moabite stone, dated 850 BC. It recalls the story of a Moabite king, Mesha's rebellion against the king of Israel, and also supplements the account of Israel's relation with Moab as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 3. Again, this uh, discovery encouraged and extended that invitation to those skeptics uh, to, to believe the accuracy and of, of, of Bible and the facts that's, uh, that are mentioned in there. One more, the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, dated to 840 BC. The first one, which was Moabite stone, it is 850 BC, and this was 840 BC. This was discovered in 1846 by A.H. Layard at Nimrud and is exhibited in British museum even today. 
It shows the Israelite king Jehu praying, paying tribute to the Assyrian king. You remember the kingdom of Israel got divided into two. One was northern and one was southern. And Assyrians, they put an end to one of the kingdom which was called Israel. And then Babylonians later on, they come and attack the kingdom which, which was very much called the kingdom of Judah. Right? And Jehu was the one who was king over the kingdom of Israel. And Assyrians, they came and they took them as captives. And one of the things about Assyrians was they were very cruel. They sprinkle their captives throughout the kingdom. They don't let them stay in one place. Once again, the black obelisk of Shalmaneser, the third discovery, invited, extended that invitation to all the skeptics and uh, all those people who distrust the word of God to believe that this is historically and archaeologically reliable, authentic word of God. And also, the name of uh, King Jehu is mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 16. We have this passage here. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as a prophet. So that is mentioned in the Bible. I'll, I'll bring to you another one, Tal Dan Stele. It comes from 9th or 8th century BC. This is a black basal stele erected by an Aramean king in northernmost Israel, containing an Aramean inscrip in inscription to commemorate his victory over the ancient Israelites. And the most interesting thing about this discovery was that they discovered the phrase, the house of David. This was very important discovery for the archaeologists. I'll tell you why. Because before that, they had a difficulty of believing whether the person by the name of David ever existed before. And when they discovered this, they believed that whatever is mentioned in the Bible, especially in relation to the house of David, is authentic and reliable. And the Babylonian chronicles. In these chronicles, or these were the clay tablets, they discovered Babylonians, they conquered over Nineveh in 612 BC. Babylon, the account of Babylonians, like their army attacks on different nations, Babylonians, they came in 597 BC into the kingdom of Judah, and they took some people as captive, and then they come back in 604, and then 6597, uh, uh, and then 605, six, that's the time when they utterly destroy the kingdom of Judah and take people captive. And uh, that's where Jeremiah, he's sitting in this ruined city and he's lamenting. And this is how the book of lamentation came into existence and is written by Jeremiah. Again, this discovery supported the authenticity and reliability of God's word. There are other nations uh, mentioned in the Bible as well. The, one of the nations is Hittites. Many scholars uh, before this discovery actually believed that Hittites, they were mythical people. They never actually existed on, on this planet. They, they never were historically even present. But then through this discovery, through the monuments that were discovered by William Wright, it was discovered the, the, the name of the nation or Hittites was, was discovered. And once again, it was proven that these people that are actually mentioned in the Bible, they existed historically. I want to take you quickly now to the New Testament. There are a number of discoveries in, the, in relation to the New Testament as well. Most of the books in the New Testament, you know that Jesus died, uh, was crucified in 31 BC, and uh, uh, not BC, 31 AD. And then after that, you have his disciples, they carried on the church and they carried on the spread of the gospel and the mission of Christ. Most of the books, they were written in the second half 
of the first century. Uh, one example that I can give you is uh, the, the book of Galatians and the two letters to the Thessalonians. They were written in AD 50. But when it comes to the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation, they were written between 90 and 100 AD, towards the end of the first century. So the New Testament books were the most frequently copied books. They were the most frequently copied and circulated books amongst the different churches. You know, Church of Ephesus, Church of Galatians, you know, the people lived in Galatia, Romans, and so scrolls were written and books were copied and then they would be sent to different churches and people as the church was spread and they had to run for their life during the persecution time. So today we have, as a result of that, today we have about more than 5,000 non-Greek new manuscripts. More than 5,000. And you see, this is a huge task. When you have more than 5,000 manuscripts, huge task for the scholarly world. So the earliest manuscript among the more than 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament is written on a small fragment of papyrus, so it's like a parchment called P52 in a, in a scholarly world, and comes from around AD 130, and that is about 100 years after Jesus' death, almost about 9,900 uh, years after 31 AD, that's when Jesus died. And on that parchment you have, that's the earliest manuscript by the way, on that you have uh, John chapter 18, verses 31 to 33, and then you have John chapter 37 and 38. I'll share with you, there is uh, called the Chester Beatty Papyri. That, that is uh, another parchment they discovered, and it was named after the owner whose name is the Chester uh, or whose name was Chester Beatty. And uh, it comes from the second or third centuries, and they consist of papyri containing portions of all four Gospels and Acts, almost all of Paul's epistles, the book of Hebrews, as well as the book of Revelation. The reason I'm sharing with this you all, all these discoveries, and by the way, because of the time, we can't even go through a little bit of that. There are so many historical, archaeological discoveries that again and again echo the reliability and authenticity of God's word. And also about uh, Paul's letters as well. You have another papyri, uh, it's called the Bodmer papyri, again named after the honor. Uh, con it contains the Gospels of Luke and John and the letters to Jude and first and second Peter, and I've got just one example here uh, for you, just, just to look at the image. I just wanted to share with you th that here are the most complete manuscripts that we have, and the New Testament that we have is based upon them. Number one is uh, Codex uh, uh, Seniatux. Uh, it was discovered by Constantine von uh, Tischendorf in St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai. We have a picture of it. Can you, can you do one more click, please, for people to know? Go back. This, this is just a, no, no, go back to the picture, please. Thank you. It's a book of Esther. This is how it looks, by the way. <laughs> it's good that you don't have to actually read that. You had to go to the university or learn that language to read that. How blessed we are that some people who worked so hard, spent endless hours, they managed to read this language and translated that. And today we have access to this Bible so that we can be blessed by reading it. When you have this book in your hands, remember it has come after hundreds of years, a lot of hard work, and many people have died and they have shed their blood to keep this book coming to you. I wish we can pay more respect and spend more time with this book because so many people actually gave the life for this book. Think about those times when there was no electricity. People actually spent endless hours next to their 
oil lamps copying, and they didn't have photocopiers, copying these manuscripts and spreading it, sharing it with the different churches and people. We have a next, next one is Codex, uh, Codex Vaticanus. Now, Codex uh, Vaticanus is from Vatican Library and is dated slightly earlier than the one which I showed you, uh, Sinaiticus. It contains the New Testament up to the book of Hebrews. And on textual grounds, many scholars believe that this is more uh, valuable and uh, of all existing New Testament manuscripts. There are more, uh, more manuscripts I can just name. I don't have time to go through them. If you could go to the next slide, please. You have, uh, by the way, just quickly go back to the slide that we had before. Just for this, uh, this on this here you can see page from Cordes Vaticanus, ending of Second Thessalonians and beginning of Hebrews. This, this is what this page is actually showing. It is coming from that codex. And uh, now we'll go to the next one. There are many other codexes as well, Codex Alexandrinus, Codex Beza, and Codex uh, Ephraimi from the 5th century BC. The Bible also describes the events and, and it mentions the names of the people. You remember when Jesus died, uh, uh, Jesus was actually trial. Jesus was presented before the Pontius Pilate, who was one of the governors. And uh, for a long time, people actually doubted that there was ever somebody by the name of Pontius Pilate who existed in the Roman history. They didn't believe that, that Jesus was ever even actually presented to anybody like that. But God led the people and the discovery was made. And uh, many scholars begin to, as I was saying, they begin to doubt the reliability of even the crucifixion of Jesus as well. So that all changed in 1961 when a piece of limestone was discovered that had inscribed the name of Pontius Pilate on this limestone. This was discovered by an, an, an archaeologist, uh, Dr. Antonio Frova, and uh, he came across this discovery while he was uh, excavating an, an ancient Roman theater in Caesarea, Israel. They discovered this inscription of Pontius Pilate upon this limestone. There was another one in Luke chapter 3 verse 1. There is a name mentioned, uh, Lysanias, who was the governor of Abilene, or Abilene, during the time of John the Baptist. And they said there was never any governor by the name of Lysanias. For a long time they doubted that there was anybody who existed by this, na this name. So this was actually countered as an error in the Bible, that this is a big mistake in the Bible. And many historians, they said that it's, it's, this, this uh, book is really corrupted and uh, is not reliable or, or, or authentic. However, they discovered uh, a discovery. It is uh, from that geographical location, uh, this di discovery, uh, they discovered inscription. And on that in inscription, there was a name, Lysanias. It was mentioned. So this discovery actually led the historians and the uh, critics to actually now begin to explain. Before they were saying that it's not reliable, it's a mistake. Now they started thinking that, okay, if there was somebody by the name of Lysanias who was the governor over Abilene, then how about the other name that they discovered? Well, they discovered that there were two people by the same name. So this discovery introduced the theory of two rulers with the same name, one about 50 years prior to the one mentioned in Luke chapter 13. So what does, where does this all lead us to? Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. This is what it says. Joshua is talking to the people of Israelites. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day 
whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. At the end of the day, it comes to choice. There are tons of discoveries and archaeological excavations that has discovered the evidences that this book is reliable, it's authentic. We have no time to go through. If we were to actually go through one by one some of the, the discoveries, they have a story behind them, how they actually came into, uh, like uh, people, how people actually discovered some of those evidences. But I just wanted you to have an overall idea that if ever you even doubted and you thought that, is this book really reliable? Does this book really have the message that can change my life? Does this, this book really has the message that tells us about the future? You remember when we read uh, in the beginning the story that is mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 36 and 37, where it talks about that Jeremiah was telling Jehoiakim about the events that are about to take place. And he wrote that on the scroll. And as you read Jeremiah chapter 36, right in the first verse, it says, these are the words of God. Jeremiah didn't say to Baruch, who was inscribing for him, that Baruch, these are my words. Jeremiah didn't say that. Jeremiah said, these are the words of God. And as that scroll went to the king, he burnt it. But him burning the scroll didn't change the future. Him burning the scroll didn't change what was about to come. Whatever was written on that scroll, exactly that happened. But unfortunate for Jehoiakim, because if you read Jeremiah chapter 36 and 37, if only he had repented, his fate would have been different. But he didn't. And many people didn't repent. They didn't listen to the word of God as it was recorded on the scroll. And their fate was way different than what it could have been. Because Babylonians did come, as was written on the scroll. Babylonians attacked and they destroyed the whole city of Jerusalem, the, the kingdom of Judah. That was the end of the last king they had was the king Zedekiah. All I would say is that if you have doubted this book, This may not do anything to this book, but the problem is that this may change your fate. This may change your future. The future that God has, this book offers. The future, critics, skeptics, they offer is not the one I want you to have. Because they will create distrust and doubt and, and they would again and again preach that this book is not reliable. Well, let's just make it, say it this way. If you believe in this book, you lose nothing. If you don't believe in this book, let's say if this book is not reliable. Just for example, let's just imagine this book is not reliable and you still choose to say, all right, I'm going to spend my time, read this book, and still just go ahead with this book. And later on, it turns out to be that this book is true. You lose nothing. Right? But imagine if you think that, oh, this book has nothing to offer me. This book is distrustful. This book has nothing to give. This book doesn't even tell about the future, and you don't even touch it. First of all, you lose this blessing of reading this book. The second, you lose the blessing of whatever is recorded in this book that is about to take place in the future. One of the discoveries that was made as I was sharing about the, about the chronicles of uh, Babylonia, in those chronicles, all the events that were recorded actually are in, the, in, in Daniel chapter 2. The kingdoms that were going to come in 539 A.D., uh, oh, B.C., Bab Babylonians were conquered by the Persians, and that was recorded in Daniel chapter 2. That happened way before those discoveries of clay tablets, right? So all I would say is that, my friends, 
if you have people who, who don't believe in this book just because they say, oh, this book is just, this has only stories and tales which probably even never happened, I hope these, some of these evidences would encourage them and inspire them to actually believe in this book. And if they still choose not to, the words of Jeshua are clear, that as for me and my household, we will choose to believe in this book. Because there are times when you can't do much for some people who choose not to believe in this book, and you can't do anything. So may God bless you as you keep on shining for him, and may God bless you as you keep on believing in this book. So I just wanted to ask you if you can raise your hand and just, just proclaim to each person present here that you do believe in the reliability and authenticity of this book. Can you just show, his, show it with your hands? And praise God for that. You know, keep on holding on to this book because this book offers us eternity. This book offers us way more than anything else can offer. I just pray that our young people can actually, instead of just listening to people, begin to spend time with this book. Just listening to preachers like me actually go and read this book because there is so much. And if they don't understand, there are so many people who can actually help and explain as well. Because many of our uh, 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 decisions that we make are, uh, especially I'm talking about our young people, they're made based upon what they hear. And I just pray that if we can actually dig and read it for ourselves and just check if those people who tell us that, oh, this book is nothing and this has nothing to offer, and just read it for, your, for, for ourselves and see if this book can still be believed or not. And I'm sure God will lead you through that journey. And uh, you will come to the conclusion that this book has eternity to offer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this book. This book has the power to change our life. This book has power to offer us hope. And I pray that may you help us through your Holy Spirit to believe in this book. Help us to trust your word. Help us to believe in what this book has. I pray for each person present here as they witness for you, as they share with other people about the authenticity and reliability and accuracy of this book. May you bless them with words Bless them with the message that can convict and inspire people. For we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.